fellow space enthusiasts, and welcome to part two of the segment on terahertz research at ASU with Justin Matthewson and John Ho. Justin and John are both part of the terahertz lab at Arizona State University and have contributed to a variety of projects that will benefit our understanding of the universe. Their work is centered on the terahertz electronics which aid in processing the signals on both balloon-borne and ground-based space telescopes. Some of these include GUSTO, the terahertz intensity mapper, or TIM, Simons Observatory, and the Large Millimeter Telescope developed by Toltec, all of which are aimed at studying the formation and evolution of stars and other properties in our galaxy in various ways. This episode will explore what goes into testing low noise amplifiers and recount the story of the great basement flood of ISTV4. We'll also touch on some technical lessons learned from experience and some insightful ones as well that I think can pretty much resonate with any listeners out there, no matter your age or area of expertise. So with that, I hope you enjoy this episode, and let's get back to some more antics in the basement. Speaking of hopping onto different projects, (laughs) um, to kind of circle back to more of like the um, building and testing of LNAs. So when you do have to actually test these uh, and kind of invalidate their performance, what exactly, what are you measuring and what are you looking for when when you do that? So we are measuring S parameters to essentially measure the gain of these amplifiers uh, so that it can show us the uh, the span of where whatever signal you're gonna pump through is going to be. So like what I the op, like what I was saying earlier, for one of our amplifiers, the optimal gain range you would have would be 0.5 to 3 gigahertz. When it actually it the range actually like kind of starts at um maybe about 10, you know, 50 megahertz maybe. And it, and it ends like right around three and a half, four gigahertz, which is the span, but like the prime uh, gain span is uh, 0.5 to three, mm-hmm. where it's just a straight flat line. And that's where the signal, the, if you're looking for a signal in that range, it's going to be the most boosted that you can read. Right, so typically like when you test, and Justin uh, has done this more than me, but when you're testing an LNA, right, the main things you're looking for are your S parameters, your dynamic range and your oh, and, noise. You're looking for your noise. Yeah, and your noise levels. So just yeah, quickly S parameters, what are those, right? Like uh, S stands for scattering parameters. It's essentially like if you have, let's say, a black box and you have a tube, like a you know, a wire going into one end of the black box and a wire coming out at the other end of the black box. You say that the wire coming in is at port one, and you say the wire coming out is at port two. And all S parameters are is they are a, a matrix that represents the scattering of signals coming in. So you have um, at port one, you have this, the reflections at port one. You know, the, the, the signal comes in and bounces back. And that is known as S11 or scattering 11. It's the scattering at port one from port one. And then you have S21, which is the scattering at port two from port one, which means the amount of signal that goes through the system comes at the other end. And this is what Justin was calling gain. So if you have a signal that comes in at one dB, right, and comes out the other end at five dB, right, you would have an S21 of four dB because that is the gain in the system, right? So when you're looking at an amplifier, the two main things you care about are the reflection and the transmission, so the S11 and the S21. And you wanna know, is there being a bunch of signal reflected if so, that's probably not good. And is there enough transmission? And is the transmission amplifying the signal? So if you have a positive real number in your S21 in your gain, it means that you are amplifying the signal in some way, and there's the gain. And then, of course, as Justin said, you have the most insipid part of it, which is the noise. Now, that entire process, there are two ways you can do it, essentially which is to, um, one way is, I guess, the normal way, which is to use a 50-ohm 
uh, kind of cutoff, or what do they call those? John, what do you call those things? Oh, uh, Terminator. Oh. Yeah, there you go, 50 ohm termination. Yeah. And essentially heat up one end of that termination with a, uh, with a temperature sensor at the end, which will raise, will, it kind of like sends a little signal-ish through the amplifier. And it'll raise, uh, if you're looking at it on a spectrum network analyzer, it kind of just raises the gain signal that you're looking at. And the difference between, uh, sorry, I didn't explain the first part. You will measure the uh, amplifier cold, which is like where it's just settled. It's just as cold as your cryostat can be. Not a lot of thermal noise at all. Yeah, not a lot of thermal noise at all. So like we'll say 10K or no, I'll say uh, 15K or so. And then we turn on that little heater that's on that 50 ohm termination and it raises up to about, we'll say 55K. So we take the difference between those two, uh, between those two measurements and that'll give us our noise. So we'll get about um, what's normal for the, our three gigahertz LNAs is about between four and six Kelvin. So it's about, or I, may, I may have this wrong, it might be about five and a half, six Kelvin of noise. Yeah, and this is, that, that test is called the Y factor measurement, right? The Y factor yeah. measurement. Now, another way that you can do it, which is much faster without having to heat up anything, which is something we constantly, constantly have to put on hold, but we wish we could do, is to essentially just have something send a signal at a cold temperature, which just, it does the Y factor, but without using the heat, uh, just sends a signal through the LNA, does the same thing, raises the gain slope, and then you can do the do it that way, which would save us hours of um, doing testing because for this you have to wait for the temperature to settle and be cold when it's cold, and then you have to wait for it to settle when you raise the temperature on the LNA. Um, yeah. When you do that, just uh, it's called. Time. Yeah, sorry, I don't want to. It's just when you when you're at these when you're at these temperatures, right? You have to let it what's called thermalize, yeah. right? This is mm -hmm. where essentially all of your photons inside there are at, are at, at a constant distribution. You know, everything has settled at a temperature, mm -hmm. right? So even if you're at 50K for your Y factor measurement, and you're ready to test, it's not gonna be evenly distributed through your system, right? You have to sit there and wait for everything to thermalize to 50K first. Yeah. That takes forever. Yeah, and which is why we needed to like, the thousandth of a decimal point, and we have to kind of wait for the tens, the tenths of the decimal point to kind of just like also be like in the middle and just kind of it can go, it can, it shouldn't move anywhere up or down, but like at the hundred, the hundredths of a decimal point, it can just like be going up and down all at once. But as long as we have like a fifty point two, and it just sits there and it doesn't go anywhere for like at I don't know, I usually wait maybe about 10 minutes to see if it's like gonna keep going up or if it just, it'll just sit there. Um, once I think it's thermalized, but if it's still going up, you're not gonna get a good measurement and your whole noise will be off. It might wind up being, it'll, you could get it like being bad as like, oh, it says it's too Kelvin of noise. It's like, that's too good to be true. Or it's like 10 Kelvin and it's just like, what the actual frick just happened? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is, and it, it, it's weird because like, it's, it's hard to understand, like if you're not working in the field, like how important noise measurements are, right? Because it seems you sit here, you hear noise and you're like, well, it's just, you know, it's just noise. It, it seems so ineffective, but that is like so essential. I mean, it's called a low noise amplifier for a reason. And it is such an essential part of getting the amplifier to minimize that amount of noise as you can, because you want to add as little to the system when you have such faint signals coming in because everything you add is going to screw up your measurement. Right. Yeah, because if you have something that's uh, terrible at handling, like making, filtering out that noise, you could get something, you could have, you could make your measurements like look really good and then like someone else does it later and they're just like, you're a dang liar. Yeah. I am trying my hardest here. <laughs> and yeah, and then, uh, Oh, and then, right, then there's the last, the last part of uh, LNA testing, right, which is the, the third, there, there's the actual amount of amplification you get, 
there's the amount of noise you get, and then there's what's called the dynamic range, which is the other big thing. The dynamic range is essentially the range of frequencies over which your amplifier operates the way it's supposed to. You know, um, if you sit, you know, if you put in a one gigahertz signal and you get the correct amplification and the correct noise, um, and you want that, you want that noise and amplification all the way up to 10 gigahertz, but at five gigahertz, you start to saturate your amplifier and you start to compress your gain, right? It's not worthwhile, right? You can't, you can't amplify your 10 gigahertz signal, which is part of your band. So you need to design these things not only to be low noise and high gain, but also take in a wide range of frequencies and be able to amplify them all in a linear fashion, you know, that is predictable and easily understood. And it is in, an incredibly complex design question, which is why having people like Hamdi around is, I mean, it's, it's such a game changer for working in astronomy, is having these people who understand these systems to such, you know, an intuitive sense that they are able to design these things that are able to do these. And it is, it is like watching Picasso sometimes, you know, NASA will send in a requirement of they need some ridiculous spec. Like recently they asked for 90 dB of, of gain, which is, you know, that's what, a billion times that's a amplification. Lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's lot. amplifying. Oh that's amplifying your voltage by like a billion. I think someone's going to get me on the squared factor there, but it's like a billion times of amplification, and they need it with a gain wobble of plus or minus one dB, right? So, like, you have to have it amplifying a billion times, but it, it can't. the The change of that amplification across your frequency band can't change by more than one dB. That's insane. And it is. It is so impossible to think about, you know, even working in the field for a while, you know, I'm sure Justin, like off the top of his head, couldn't think of a solution to this either. I know I sure can't, but Hamdi will just go sit in his office for two or three house. days. Yeah, it's or his, yeah, his garage. And then he'll just come back and NASA will just give him these impossible specifications and he'll walk into the lab and be like, I got it, guys. And I'm just like, holy crap, dude. Did you do this? We yeah, actually, we actually did this. Um, we did, or I presented on it. But John was also on the project with me, or for uh, the presentation at ISSTT, um, which was just before COVID hit, where we kind of talked about this specific amplifier that John's talking about. Um, it was for a project called Comets. Uh, it's um, was it a terahertz spectrum? I don't really know much about comets, I'm going to be honest. <laughs> if, I, if I recall, I think it's a terahertz uh, mapping spectrometer that's, um, that's going to be uh, orbiting around a, a comet at some point in time. Um, and Hamdi built this 90 dB uh, amplifier that uh, has really, really flat gain. It's like... Plus or minus one. Yeah, plus or minus one dB of gain. Uh, it's completely bias dependent. You get like... If you send in, uh, I don't know, two volts, you get this gain, and you send in three volts, it's this gain. Completely bias dependent. And it's still flat no matter how much you pump up the voltage yeah. until a certain point. But I'm going to test that when I actually finish designing and building a single channel. Yeah, it was pretty funny at the conference, too, um, after Justin gave the uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, the, the only question people really had was they're like watching it and they're like, how did you, like, how did you do this? <laughs> like, how on earth did you make this thing? And like, Justin was standing up there, like looking at all of us and we we're like, I don't know, ask Hamdi. And that's yes. like the only answer you can give is just like, ask Hamdi. Like, we have no idea how he does it. It's wizardry. Yeah, I said specifically in the presentation, like any specific questions, like how did this, how is this achieved? Please ask the designer and engineer, Hamdi Manny. <laughs> Yeah, and Justin's uh, Justin's talk at that conference was right after mine, and I gave a uh, somewhat controversial uh, <laughs> a controversial <laughs> talk on a new algorithm that uh, I'm designing with uh, Adrian and Ryan for the FPGA that like no one wanted to believe worked. Um, so people were already pretty uh, suspicious of our lab when Justin <laughs> went up there, and they saw the results, and they're like, "You guys are just full of it. Like none of your stuff is Same. real." We're like, we swear we're doing it. Like, we promise it's happening. Yeah. I had um, someone come up to me after the uh, conference saying, like, I really liked your entire presentation. It's really good. One thing, this particular thing is wrong. And I think it was the plus or minus, uh, no, it was the uh, noise factor being less. Yeah. 
he is just like, yeah, that's impossible. It's like, okay, this is not a problem you should bring to me. I didn't design this. Yeah, it's like we just tested it and we saw that it worked. And it's yeah. like, well, he did it, you know? Like if you have that specific like qualm with this uh, amplifier, you should talk to the person who created the whole thing overall. Like I'm doing this and presenting it for him because I wanted to do it because that it's something I wanted to do. But yeah. I tried to explain like as best I can, like this is what this amplifier is and does. I didn't, wasn't expecting that, but then as John said, um, or at least I think I got it from John. It's like, this is a rite of passage. You've been told you were wrong. This is what science is like. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is. It really, if you get people, the general rule is if, if you have someone mad at the end of your talk, when you present at a conference, um, you, you are doing it right. You, if everyone is happy and, you know, agreeable at the end of your talk, you're not doing anything, you know? Yeah. And I, that's not to, to discount people who, I shouldn't say that, but like, that's not the fun of science. The fun of science is challenging people and having people get mad at you and not believe in you and stuff. That's what it's all about. I mean, it's all throughout history, just like yeah. I mean, from gravity yeah. to uh, uh, black holes. Yeah. Yeah. Even and that's why, like, at the yeah, that's why at the end of my talk with the tone tracking algorithm, you know, like I was like I ran away after the talk because I like didn't want to have to talk to any of these like super old head scientists in the field and get beat up over it, but. I did feel pretty cool that they were all mad at me. I was like, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Is that why, so I, I'm assuming Hamdi wasn't at this conference. Is that, is that why he wasn't? He might have was been. He? Hamdi was at, well, no. He was working, I think. He was working. So technically yeah. he was at the conference because it was at ASU. Mm -hmm. But he was like off doing Hamdi things because that's what Hamdi needs to do. Yeah. And what I mean by Hamdi things is like he's doing it he's designing building testing because he's he had a lot of work to do at that time okay uh so to continue off of testing one thing one thing i'm curious about with all the the projects that you've shared is what kind of war stories you have from things that have <laughs> uh maybe broken along the way we can kind of tell the yeah. tell the flood story in in this segment yeah. of the talk can we start with something small first, John? Yeah, oh, yeah, we could start with something smaller than the Great Flood, because that's that's really about <laughs> as good as it gets. Um, I'm going to talk about how John blew up one of Hamdi's amplifiers somehow. Multiple times. Multiple times. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, okay. That It wasn't necessarily my fault. It was oh. the, the power source. It was. Okay. And, okay, okay. Well, let's uh, quick. This is, this is a decent war story, because okay. it, it was more funny than dangerous. It didn't cost that much money. Well, but let me uh, explain what you're, which one you're using at first. So this is one of the uh, the, the uh, amplifiers for Simon's Observatory. Now this is our most sensitive amplifier. Like it's like Hamdi, with all his glory, can make this thing like work, and you could literally just throw it around the room and it would still work. Um, this one's still like the most sensitive because you never know when you can just completely shock the entire chip out of existence. And John somehow managed to do that with my supervision as I'm watching him do this. <laughs> four times. Four times. Four times. Just somehow blew up four amplifiers. And like he was as careful as can be. Because I made sure he was careful. He's like, I don't want to build any more of these. I already built these all at once. Please don't make me do this again. Yeah. Well, it was so we were working on a project with uh, Adrian Tang at JPL, who's a su I mean, he's a super genius. He designs these uh, CMOS spectrometers. So these, these tiny little spectrometers um, that do fast Fourier transforms on chips the size of your pinky nail, right? And it does like a thousand. It, the one we had was his sixth version or something like that. And it was a, it was a fast Fourier transform with 1,024 channels, I think. So for people who don't know, fast oh. Fourier transforms is how you break up things from the time domain to the frequency domain. So if you have a signal that's a bunch of different frequencies all combined, um, you can actually split it apart into its individual aspects. It's, I call it like the anti-smoothie machine or the anti-blender in the same way that you take a bunch of fruits to make a smoothie. Um, the fast Fourier transform essentially takes the smoothie and will take out the individual fruits and tell you what fruits are in the smoothie just with a signal instead. Um, so we were testing this and we needed to test what was called the Allen variance, which is the stability over time of it, because we wanted to use this, uh, this spectrometer on this water detection cube set, um, that, which is, was a lot of my 
first couple of years of work were designing parts for this thing. And uh, to do this, we needed to pump it full of white noise because you just need a random signal in there and you hold it on and you run this complicated algorithm that uh, Cassie, Cassandra Witten wrote a very, very, a beautiful C code to do. And uh, we had to take this white noise generator that we had in the lab that pumped out at like negative, what it was, 80 dB or something like that. And so it, it was, it's an incredibly quiet white noise, but it's pure white noise. It's done, it's created on a quantum level. I think it's of like, of electrons moving in different arrival times. It's pretty neat how it works, but it comes out very faint. But I had to amplify it about 70 dB, which again is about 10 million times to get uh, to a point where the spectrometer could read it. So to do this test, I had to build essentially a massive amplification box um, to amplify this up. And I used three different amplifiers to do it inside the box. And this was a huge, like two week long process to build because it had to be shielded from RF interference. Because when we were doing it at first, we had it all on a lab bench. And when people were getting like text messages and emails on their phones, part of that signal was leaking into the system and was just like so much louder than the white noise. So it was just about to like, Every time you got a text message, there was a chance it was going to blow up this $10,000 spectrometer oh, I had. So it was a whole process. And then for some reason, every time I, I would turn it on and I had it built. So you just had to plug in five volts and it would just turn the whole thing on. You plugged in the white noise on one side and it would come out the other 10 million times louder. And every time I would turn it on, it would just like fizzle out. And the noise would just drop to nothing and the whole chain would be broken and we couldn't figure it out. And I would open it up and every time I would bring it back to Justin and be like, I don't know what happened. And he'd be like, he blew up my amplifier again. <laughs> and this happened four times in a row. And it was just so aggravating because we were being so careful with this thing and it kept blowing up. And these are beefy, beefy amplifiers, you know, even though I was blowing them up. And it turned out that the issue was that I was using a power, a, uh, like a voltage supply, a power supply in our lab, an old brick one. And it, it was so old and so broken that we didn't notice that whenever you turned it on, for some reason, I don't know if it was like stored capacitance or something, but the power would spike to its maximum before it went down to what you wanted. So we had it set to like five volts. When you would click it on, it would shoot in like 30 volts very quickly. Mm -hmm. And in that time period, every time I would do that, in that split second, it would blow up the entire system. Mm. Now, I also so, like to do that this, um, we always had the voltage set to zero before we turned it on. Right. Yeah. So we would have it set to zero. We would click it on and it would still blow it up. And we were like, what the heck is happening here? And it turns out that it was the power source blowing it up. Um, and it's just, it was just so classic, right? Like we thought we were doing everything right mm. and we were following all the rules and yet we still blew up thousands of dollars worth of equipment. <laughs> over a week-long period because one thing that shouldn't have been a problem was actually broken yeah. and that power source is still in our lab <laughs> and we never threw um, it out actually no it's not in there anymore it's not i put it i put a little uh, I, label I on it i think we got rid of it it's I yeah in the lab lately yeah i just we called it the nuke source because it would yeah. just nuke everything it touched That's perfect. now good thing we finally switched to the more actual one that is almost impossible to blow up yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. The one that we normally would build just before the Simons one, we switched to that one and then it was okie day, like all the time. We just had to do some modifications. How did you yeah. catch so that? In a, oh, was it, were I you had reading it out? Like, were, were you logging the voltage um, through a script yeah. or was it just like you just saw it flash and it's like, oh, wow. So I think what we, I, if it's I'm remembering flash. correctly, yeah, we, we did it the four times and it blew up each of the four times. And then um, I remember looking at the power source on the fourth time we did it because we had set it to zero. And I remember a split second when you would click it, all the numbers would max out. And I thought that was just like the system turning on. But after the fourth time of it happening, I remember like talking to Justin and being like, do all of them do this? And he was like, I don't think so. So we hooked up the actual power source itself to... Uh, you know, an analog or a power meter or something. Yeah. I can't remember. And uh, we just like took a trace of it. And when you'd click it on, you would see it spike all the way up mm -hmm. to maximum power and then drop down very quickly. And that's you, but it's the same thing as in every single, like when you're working in an electronics lab, that's the issue is when you have a problem and you don't know the exact source, you have to go through every single element of your system and test every single thing 
to a ridiculous degree before you can find it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably like the most common type of war story you find in our lab is us blowing things up accidentally because we, we accidentally messed something up. You know, we, we started a chop shop in our lab. Again, more stories that Mark Buren will kill us for. <laughs> but we started it. We'll make sure he we never hears this podcast. I don't, yeah, think we, I don't think he'll kill us for this one particularly. This one isn't too bad, but we started a TV repair shop in the lab uh, for free. We weren't charging any money, and we, we were just keeping the TVs for ourselves. Yeah. So it wasn't really a shop. But we would get broken TVs and bring them in. And like most of the time for smart TVs, you could just pull out the control board in the back and shove it in an oven and heat it up and melt all the solder again and put it back in, and it would work. But one time we pulled out like the LED strips from an LCD TV and we were trying to plug them in to see if we could get bright flashlights and don't know what we did wrong, but all like the lights blew up and like shattered glass everywhere. Oh um, Wait, yeah. I wasn't there for this one. Oh, you weren't? Uh, maybe that was me and Lucas. I've never seen or that was those actually. TVs in there. Where do, is this recent? Really? Oh, I, mean, I have one cause... right here. So yeah, it is. Oh, okay. John has one in his uh, room right now that we Yeah, I have one right here. I have like a 45-inch TV I'm working on. Perfect. There's this a fix. People don't realize this. People throw out TVs, and they don't realize how cheap and easy it is to fix these things. So um, if, if you ever want uh, to have your TV fixed, bring them on down to Terahertz Lab at 8. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, same, same website, thc.asu.edu. Fill out the contact thing. Be like, I got a TV. Yeah, contact John or I. You guys need yeah, like we'll, a, we'll an old fashioned sign or, you know, like someone's like <laughs> yeah. walking. It's yeah. like a little cartoon man walking yeah. with the TV. Yeah, we should. We should. We should totally do that. <laughs> can get, can that, that li I'll we, buy we a t shirt. Make, we need to think of a cool name first. Yeah, I need a cool business name. It'll be a little side uh, thing. Yeah, beta shell side. Then. Yeah, beta shell side project. There you go. But the TVs alone, you know, that's a lot of, like, we, we, we had no idea what we were doing. Like, plasma TVs, super dangerous. Oh, super dangerous. Worst. You do not want to touch <laughs> that plasma stuff. It'll hurt you bad. John has first handed. Yeah. And we just would cut these things open. Yeah. I was, like, using, like, the, uh, the jigsaws to carve the plastic off the TVs and stuff. Just, uh, it just <laughs> yeah, stupid things, firing plastic everywhere. Um, but, thank, I mean, no one's ever really gotten hurt badly in the lab burns holes in their hands because the soldering iron slips you know yeah. stuff like that um happens from time to time yeah we have sometimes we would have leaks of stuff we had the freon leak in the lab uh, uh, but that was from a refrigerator yeah uh but the best story is definitely the great oh, flood yes the yeah great flood. the great flood of what 2019 yeah 2019 2019 all right I think let so. me start that one off because i yeah I was, I was first person there. Um, I was on my way out of the lab. I was one of the last, there was only two people left, me and Jacob. We were, uh, I was like, oh, I just got done. I packed up everything. I had just left the room where this had happened also. <laughs> and I'm in the hallway and then I hear Jacob just say, hey, Justin, can you come here for a second? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sure. And I walked down to where he's like, do you hear that? I was like, hear what? He's like, it's like a, a whooshing noise. Like, it's not anything unusual. And then we kind of look down, and then there's just water kind of seeping out into the hallway. And we're like, oh, oh, crap. And I just, I walk up to the window, and I see, like, the valve for um, the water just broken off completely. Yeah, like all the labs, because we need constant cold water, right? We have main lines to the cold water lines of the building. And every, every lab has a big tube that comes down and you can plug things into it and get, you know, cool water or hot water or stuff out of it. And we were um, trying to, um, we were trying to set up a new cryo cooler in that room for, for these valves. And so I just see water immediately coming out and I tell Jacob, go find Mark Beard. And so he runs down the hall as I open up the door and try to unplug all like our million dollars of equipment that are just in that room. It was like, oh, please do not fry anything for the love of God. I immediately just shut down our, both of our VNAs. I shut down our spectrum analyzers. Now, the one thing 
I didn't know at the time when I had walked in that room, in the little sub room that's in that room is the, uh, was it the CNC machine, John? Oh, yeah. Yeah, the curd, the curd Evo. Yeah, the curd. So apparently if that were to have had water seep into that room, everybody would be screwed because apparently it, so the outlets are on there. I, I, yeah, I was the one who realized that at first when uh, I walked in that room. Thankfully, it was dry. Yeah. Yeah, like as, as a little bit of like magnitude context, right? Like our lab is an entire hallway of the basement, right? It's a huge double laboratory. And then we have a third part of the laboratory, which is owned by Chris Groppy, which is like specifically the terahertz equipment. It's, it's like a lot of stuff that Hamby uses, but it's very expensive equipment in there specifically for the terahertz stuff, which has a, and it has a back room where we have a, you know, half million dollar CNC machine, a, a computer controlled mill that can, you know, drill a hole through a piece of hair, which is used to create waveguides. And it's this massive structure, you know, probably 10 feet tall and six feet wide. It's this giant cylinder. And all of the power comes from an outlet in the floor. And uh, the water that was coming out of the, the main room was like gushing out. I mean, like it was probably, you know, like, a few gallons, you know, a couple gallons every second exactly or two. Second or so. Yeah. And it, it, I mean, like very fast water flow, like you had turned on a shower, but more than that. Yeah. And it was just like flooding out into this room. And it was like slowly seeping its way to the door that led to the back room. Yeah. And had that water like flown all the way in and then reached that outlet and fallen in, we were all just like standing in the water and the water was like slowly rising up to our ankles. And we would have all been cooked. I mean, I, I don't act, you know, I, I haven't worked out the actual fields on a whiteboard, so I don't know if we would have died or gotten shocked, but it was very scary. That was definitely the most dangerous part. Yeah. Um, but this water continued to gush out, and that room itself probably has, you know, like, I mean, realistically, like, at least a million dollars of electronics in it, right? Yeah. About, about. Yeah. Like and, uh, yeah. Like half a and it was flowing out so fast that we were trying to like bucket it and bring it out, but we couldn't. And like, we were like leaving trash buckets to fill up as it was going. The water was already up to our ankles and we couldn't even move the trash buckets. Cause if you've ever filled up a trash can with water before and tried to move it, you realize that water is pretty heavy. <laughs> and like, we needed like three or four people to carry each of the trash cans to the shower room to dump it down. And we were trying to get it out of the room to save the electronics equipment and stuff like that. So we were like pushing it in the hallway with brooms and stuff. I remember that. And the water was just like flooding so fast that it was like flooding the hallway, like, you know, a solid, like, you know, 10, 20 meters out, flowing into the other people's labs, other people's, like other students well, from their labs mad at us and stuff. Well, let's, uh, Handy kind of got a broom and started sweeping it into the hallway, which there should have been a drain in the hallway, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, there's no drains down there because you don't expect it. To there to be a yeah. flood or anything yeah i think it exactly. reached all the way to the end of the hallway i don't even remember because yeah. we were sitting and that was over the summer when we were sitting in there finishing up phoenix and i i don't remember how we realized it but it was just like we were just coding and testing our code on on the obc and then i don't know if someone walked in the room or someone went outside and noticed that there was just water everywhere but we just like turned around and water seeping through the door and we're like okay <laughs> time to get oh, yeah, everything off the that. floor <laughs> yeah go help out with that like it was a lot i mean it was it was flooding other labs it was that much water yeah. coming yeah. out it um we lost the one wire bonder that handy had yeah. to fix we almost lost our brand new wire bonder which was sitting mm -hmm. next to it because the water was pointed straight at the uh, old wire bonder just like shot straight into it just like it was mm. you picked up and it was like it was dumped in 10 feet of water yeah like well this thing's screwed it was like at least save the new wire runner so i immediately just picked that up and moved it out yeah and like the the big things is we had the uh the the we had two vnas in there at the time and the vnas which are virtual network analyzers which is how you analyze a microwave circuit these are incredibly expensive equipment like the the really nice one we have is probably upwards of a half million dollars I, um yeah. Maybe 200, actually quarter. I think it's about 200. Yeah, yeah 250, yeah. Um, and we had two of these things in there, like right next to this water source, just like pouring out onto it. So we like ran all these things out in the hallway. Yeah. And the, the one benefit of Arizona, right, is that, you know, if you get something slightly damp 
and you get it out of the water fast enough, it'll dry off in 10 seconds. So that's what we were hoping for. Um, but I mean, this, it, the water just kept coming and coming and coming. And we were just taking pictures of everything because we were like, we're going to need insurance and all this stuff. It was flooding into other labs. And then the big question was, I mean, how did the water start flowing? You know, how does such a catastrophic failure happen in this lab? And it was a big question that like no one wanted to really answer for like a week afterwards. Like I think I have the broke answer. the water valve. Yeah. And like we really have never gotten, you know, we have uh, theories, but like no, no, I, I actually an undergrad. I actually do have an answer, John. Um, so Hamdi was working with Sasha and Farzan, and they were they were setting up this valve for their new cryo cooler that they were going to put in there. This is before it was even in there, but they're like getting it ready. To, so like, the, how, I, how I do know is that they had shut off the valve because they made sure that it worked and that it was gonna flow like relatively slowly. And then they walked away. So this is like, they walked away at like kind of the same time I walked out of that room and it was just fine. And then they, had just disappeared somewhere. And I think they went to Andy's office to like kind of find something or a tube just to hook onto there. And then I think that's when it, the pressure just like kind of built up because it wasn't meant to hold that kind of pressure, just snap the thing off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was within that time span of about 10 minutes from me and all of them just leaving the room that the pressure built up, it just couldn't handle and it just broke off. And what the, uh, the uh, building people had said is that, yeah, that valve wasn't meant to hold that kind of pressure and it probably should have been changed, I don't know, maybe years ago or however long that's been there. Interesting. So it was failure on a lot of different parts. Yeah, and they were just like surprised that it hadn't happened earlier. <laughs> yeah. I remember that day, it was Friday as well. It was Friday, yeah. Caleb, who was an old grad student who worked with us, was back in town. And whenever Caleb's back in town, it's a big deal because, you know, uh, he's good friends with our advisor and we always go drinking on Fridays anyway. You know, we have uh, Fridays at Four Peaks with our entire lab. Yeah. Um, and and we were all getting ready to go, right? And we always leave at like 3.30, 3.45 on Fridays for this yeah. thing. And, we, and just because Caleb was there, we were there a little later than usual, around like four. And that's when this thing started. And because we were there a little later than usual, we all happened to be there for this thing. And we had, you know, a dozen people who were there to get everything out of the way, clean up the mess and stuff like that. But I always think if that had happened 30 minutes later, we would have oh, all been gone and we would have lost millions yeah. of dollars of electronics. We would have been pushed back months, if not a year on multiple different projects, lost so much data, so much science. I mean, it could have been so bad. And people could have died, realistically, if they had, like, walked in the wrong water. Yeah, the thing is, no one would have known for, like, hours, too, because the door was closed, and that water wasn't, like, seeping out a lot. It was just, like, why is there water on It's not right. Yeah, it was until well we the door room. that we, yeah, that yeah. we noticed yeah. it. Yeah, the rooms are sealed for pressure, you know? They're sealed so that the pressure is maintained, which mm -hmm. means it's a pretty good seal. So the water would have built up in there quite a bit before yeah. we really started to notice. Yeah. yeah, and I wouldn't have had was, access to that room, so I couldn't have, like, opened the door and tried to no. save anything, so that's, yeah. Yeah, I have a, I remember I have a video, oh, I, it's right here, yeah. I you have can a video see, also. Just, yeah, you uh, can just see the entire, the entire hallway in this video just, like, absolutely flooded. It is insane. Yeah, it sucks that the uh, people out there can't see the videos. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. yeah, I remember after that, yeah. it was just like, okay, well, it's time to go get a beer now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we, yeah. we drank after that, for sure. Yeah, you can see it there. Like, look at that. That the hallway oh is just God. absolutely flooded with water. Yeah, I have a picture. Yeah. See, thankfully, crazy. yeah, thankfully someone on your Phoenix team, uh, I don't know, remember who it was. It was a, a guy, it was an undergrad, was a photographer, and just happened to have a decently nice camera that day, mm. like a DSLR with him. And it was very convenient because he just stood there, like, documenting the whole thing. So we had it for insurance purposes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So overall, we got lucky, and overall, the financial damage was not too bad. Um, everything was covered that did get broken. Uh, we managed to fix almost everything else. Uh, new rules on the water system. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it, was, it was easily the worst accident I've ever had at work. Yeah. We 
I forgot that we had covered all the doors with the, like, I think flood kits from three different labs. Oh, yeah. So there were spill kits mm -hmm. that, yeah. yeah, we used to block the doors so that it wouldn't flood the other labs as well. Oh, my God. Not do it. Yeah, we did not do it for the geology labs because we only blocked our labs. I felt really bad about that later because a bunch of the geology students were coming out. Like, I, completely, heck, man? Yeah. Yeah. I completely forgot that we had just gotten the cryo cooler for the gusto testing. Yeah. And it was in that lab that day. I'm like, oh, crap. Yeah. So we Anyways. lost a lot. Yeah. Okay, so th this this has been this has been really awesome. Uh, I just have a couple of just kind of fun last last questions. Um, so, first one is so out of out of everything that you guys have worked on uh, and everything we've talked about, what would you say are some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? Can be technical, can be more um, you know soft skills oriented. Anything that you want to share? Yeah. I mean, I definitely have like two that immediately come to mind. Uh, the first being that, like, I think that the, one of the biggest parts of, of grad school in general, but of just researching and working in like a science lab where everything is, is, does take experience to understand and have intuition is that no one is an expert until they're an expert, right? Um, it's very easy to go and start working in a lab or at grad school and um, feel that you're an imposter. And there's this idea of imposter syndrome that's really common in grad school um, because you see everyone around you who's done all these incredible things and you feel are incredible scientists and you are just a person who is around these brilliant people. Um, and uh, it takes a long time until you realize uh, that those people, the only difference really between you and them is a time difference. Um, and there are a lot of concepts and, and, uh, and just general ideas that go far beyond academia and science and are in every single field um, that, that really just take time to get intuition. And like, I remember in undergrad, I had to take like a full year advanced e &M course my junior year, and I did terribly in it. I got like a C plus and a B minus. And uh, I remember when I finished, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my career in physics or science, but all I know is I'm never going to work in electronics or e &M. And, you know, here I am now, and I retook that course again for my master's, and I, I did super well in it. And uh, it, it, felt, it felt like a weird kind of, you know, redemption, revenge story in a way, because, you know, I, I did this thing that I thought I was off at, but it really did put things into perspective that it's so easy to get dissuaded from complex topics and complex ideas or just anything that requires experience when you first start. And I've learned just, I guess, this grit from all of this time dealing with things that I don't understand, where you do learn that if you just spend long enough on a Wikipedia page, you can learn something. And uh, I think that's such, a, such an important kind of lesson to be learned in every field is that like that intimidation and that imposter syndrome that you have is something that everyone has had and no matter how smart or how talented someone seems to be they were a newbie once too you know um so uh, you know i've been trying to carry that a lot more with me and not get dissuaded when i have to start new projects and uh i feel like that's an important lesson for for really everyone to understand yeah sorry J justin you can go next i don't want to keep talking oh, i was trying to think of mine but it's hard to pinpoint a specific one when kind of my whole career is basically just the gigantic learning experience because when I came to the lab I knew absolutely nothing I didn't know I had a general idea of what an LNA was uh, until I got like the full explanation of how like kind of works in an RF chain to I never knew how to actually operate a vector network analyzer or spectrum network analyzer. I had no idea how to do noise measurements. Like it was a giant learning curve for me just because my whole background was more of like engineering and like kind of designing rather than like more the testing and building side as much as I wanted to build as uh, as I said earlier. And just coming to it and being around like I was just learning everything through osmosis, through whether it be through Hamdi, Chris, John, 
Cassie, Marco, anybody in our lab who's just just a gigantic, it's a, all, it was all a learning experience. Trial by fire. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> it's like they, they threw me to the flames. And it's like, will you survive? I'm still here. Yeah. I mean, that is the way that it works, like, uh, especially with undergrads. And this is not, you know, unique to our lab, but it is very much, a, you know, Chris calls it Lord of the Flies. <laughs> is, uh, you know, there are a lot of undergrads who say they want to help and get into science. Um, and, you know, we, will, we give every single one of them the opportunity. You know, we never turn anyone away regardless. And only one out of every 10 or 20 actually, you know, sticks around. And it's not because they're smarter, quote unquote, or better at it. It's because, you know, they, they some combination of passion, motivation, and willpower, you know, makes them continue to come down every day. And those are the people that stay and become experts. Yeah, the same thing was on Phoenix too. Like we, we would hire, you know, like, well, not hire because we weren't paying them, but we, we would get uh, like six new people on the flight software team, you know, at the beginning of the semester. And at the end, like one person stayed. Uh, and it, it was like that, it was like that for a lot of people. At, at the end when it was more like programming and you know, putting things together, that, then that's when there was a very, like, concentrated group of people, and it was mostly software-oriented. At the beginning, it was, it was definitely, it was a lot more people doing a lot more things, so I, I don't want to say that uh, too out of context, but yeah, we definitely did have many swings of trying to get people onto the project, and then, you know, they just kind of fade off because they're students first, yeah. and, and they, you know, you put, they have lives. You, yeah, <laughs> you, sh you should, I mean, you, sh you should put, you should make your classes a priority, um, but yeah, the people who stayed were definitely the ones who were passionate about the project itself and, and just really wanted to make it work and, and really wanted to deliver something that was great. And you just, you felt that from every single person who was working on the project and it was great. Um, that was like one of my favorite parts of working on Phoenix was, was feeling that from everybody and feeling like as a group, we all wanted this, this common goal. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, it is. Uh, and again, like those are the people that become the experts, you know, it's uh, you, you can be anyone and walk into that lab. And if you have the right mix to stick there, you know, you will be an expert one day too. It's, it's a, it's like a, you know, a, a boulder turning into a pebble, you know, you have to stand in that river for a long time. I think I think that is also part of like the second big lesson that I learned too, which is that um, th this is it seems like you know a common thing to say, but there are so many different types of intelligence and so many different factors that are included in what is quote unquote intelligence. Um, and this is uh, you know something that I learned when I did my doctoral candidacy exam my second year, which is you know it's it's a terrifying idea. You have to you know study essentially all of the physics and astronomy you've ever learned. And you have this massive like four hour exam or two, three, four hour exam, depending on how long they want to cook you for, where you have, you know, five experts in your field and you just sit down in a room with five professors and they have an open field just to ask you anything they want. Um, and it's terrifying when you're, when you just start starting grad school, because you just came out of undergrad and you don't know anything and you see all these people above you and it's the same imposter syndrome thing. And uh, you think there's no way I can do this. And you look around at your peers as well. And, you know, especially in the lab that Justin and I work in, and I'm sure he can back me up on this, is we work with some very, very intelligent people. You know, I, I grew up my entire life with, you know, Cassie, who is easily one of the smartest people that I've ever met in my life. You know, we work with Adrian Sinclair, who, you know, at 21, 22, was already world-class FPGA designer. We have undergrads like Ryan, who are just incredibly intelligent, um, and Eric and Jacob and everyone else, Emily and Jenna, and they are all very smart people, and it is very intimidating to work with them. And you think that you are just not as smart. Um, but I, I learned throughout the experience of taking this candidacy exam that, uh, you know, your intelligence isn't just the speed of the CPU in your brain, you know? Like, you know, I will never be as fast as, you know, comprehending, you know, mathematics or physics equations as, let's say, Cassie is, right? You know, she is able to look at something and immediately understand what it's saying. 
but there are so many other factors that can contribute to your success and contribute to your intelligence. And these things are, you know, your communication skills and your networking. And eventually, you know, I ended up um, creating a team of, of people, of, of people I had met and known, and I did mock practice calls with them. And uh, this team I had was in, in a lot of ways tougher than any group I could ever make for the test. You know, these old grad students and friends I had who grilled me um, prepared me so well for this test that I was able to breeze through the candidacy exam. And it wasn't because of the speed of my CPU, right, which, you know, gets outclocked by most of the people in the lab, but it was the fact that I, you know, had created these relationships and these networks with people and, you know, these trusts with people who I was able to call upon and communicate with and learn the strategies to do it. And it really just proved to me that like, you know, people always will ask, you know, like compare, you know, now that you're in a PhD program, you know, like how do you stand in terms of the intelligence? And it's such an impossible thing to measure, you know? It's impossible to measure how well this huge combination of skills, of communication, keeping it cool, making networks, being able to solve problems in creative ways rather than just straightforward ways. Um, these all combine into what constitutes intelligence in a workplace. And it's it really, there are few places as visible as academia when it comes to that. Um, and I think that the whole grad school experience, and it's something that the three of us have just said, you know, all combined into one is that like, everyone is smart, you know, and sure, you know, you can bring me some counter examples and stuff like that. But uh, never be intimidated because you think you're not smart enough is really what I've learned in grad school. All you got to do is use the skills that you have, and keep your head down and work, and you will be the expert one day. So <laughs> I think yeah. none of us know how to. Um, there, to there's really no follow up to that. <laughs> yeah, there is no follow up to that. <laughs> that is no. That's that's a very that is a very beautiful thing to say. Um, cause I think I think that is something that can you know resonate with ev with pretty much everyone on on sub level. So um, I I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, like education breeds insecurity, right? Like from the time we were in elementary school, and it makes me think of like people I went to even grade school with who just said like, oh, you know, I'm bad at math. And it's like, you know, back then in, in, in high school, it was like, well, I'm not. Um, but now, you know, as you get older and you hit your wall, you know, like I had trouble with calc, multivariable calc when I first took it. I had trouble with e &M when I first took it. And I thought I was just bad at these things, right? And I look back and I think like, what point in mathematics did these people hit the wall and just decide that, oh, because I can't do this one tiny part of this entire structure of mathematics, did they decide, oh, I'm bad at it? When, they, when realistically they should have gone back and had, you know, looked at it better with, you know, personalized teaching and stuff like that and relearned the subject and gone on back with the track, instead they have, were just convinced that they were bad. And this happens so often in academia. And it's sad because like, that's not the way it should be. You should, you should hit a wall and say, okay, the way I'm learning this isn't working for me. You know, not I'm dumb. Yeah. So, yeah. Gosh, I mean, that, oh, no, go, go, go. no, 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 I'm that, that was really it. It's just, I, I feel like I, not only I miss so many opportunities in my life, but I feel like so many opportunities are missed in the current educational system because of the way we, we judge people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wish that were, I wish that were something that was, you know, at least like taught to somehow taught to every freshman when they come to college because college is so intimidating. Yeah. Um, it was, it's, and especially like what I, like when I came into engineering, I really didn't have much of a background in engineering. I, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't join a robotics club. I just really liked math and I liked science. And so, you know, it's coming in thinking, oh, you know, all these people are going to know so much more about all these topics than me. And it was, it is really intimidating, but, um, I think you, you need that message to just say, you have to, you have to find your support system and you have to learn how to evaluate how you're learning and not look at things in, in that bad light. Um, always be persistent and just, so yeah, you know, <laughs> you can get better at it. Yeah. Too. Yeah. You know, have, have some confidence in yourself. Yeah. yeah. Because my, my dad has told me a thousand times in like a bunch of different ways that um, 
you may be bad at it now, but you'll always get better at it as you go, as you get older. Like, um, he told me that my uncle, I may have this a little fuzzy, I think he told me that my uncle had failed college, but he still, he never gave up and he went right back and he got his degree and now he's a very successful man. It's like, you just need to be persistent. You got to be stubborn with it and just keep at it. Yeah. What's that? What's that uh, line from Adventure Time? You guys with Jake, uh, the dog. He's like uh, sucking at something is the first step to being kind of good at something. Yeah, that's, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's all right. of learning, all of academia. Right, you're gonna suck at first, and if you don't, well, you got lucky on this one, but you're gonna suck eventually. You know? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and it really helps when, like, you know, you're chasing something that you're passionate about, um, and just never never lose sight of that no. not, not i guess not to get too too far into the weeds in this one but yeah you, you do have to r remind yourself of why you're passionate about yeah, why are you there in the first place right yeah and it's very important and it's easy to lose sight of those things especially as you make it a career it's easy to get lost in the weeds of that and uh, it's important to remember why you're there why you love it in the first place and that you know everyone else has done the same things as you mm -hmm. Now you'll, no matter how smart the person is that you think you're working with, you know, they have, they are, they are not thinking about how smart they are. They are worried about their own insecurities and they are jealous of you in certain ways as well. And, you know, if we could all just appreciate the things that other people are jealous of more and help them out with that, you know, that'd be a much better way to handle this education. But that's a whole different podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll just start a second podcast. That's yeah. All about, education all about podcast. This topic. Yeah. This is we'll education. Solve all the problems in the world. I think, you know, this is, a, this is another sub project of your company. <laughs> yeah. Beta Shell solves all the problems. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you haven't plugged your company. Oh, yeah. 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 I guess I'll, I guess I'll do that next. quickly. Yeah. Uh, this will be, you know, my How final did it start. Plug. Yeah. So I, uh, oh, God, this is the first time we're revealing this story publicly. Uh, they might, yeah. Alpha Core yeah. might actually hear about this now. <laughs> um, will so, they care though? No, they won't. We, we're harmless. Uh, so yeah. there's yeah. this, uh, there, there are, the people in our lab have a, a pretty varied skill set, right? So often um, outside companies will come in and seek help um, from people in our lab and talk to our advisors and say like, hey, you know, we're an outside company doing this, you know, can we team up and, you know, use some of your people and some of your equipment and stuff. And uh, one of these people is uh, Eric Weeks in our lab. He's, um, he's our lab manager now. He was actually an undergrad when I first joined, but he, had, he was in the Marines earlier. He, he's he was in the uh, Army Reserves. Ar uh, Marine Reserves, sorry. Yeah. Um, he, but he's a solid decade, solid decade older than us. Um, so, you know, he came in and obviously had a managerial you know, kind of position in his eye, not in his eyes, but like we all saw him as a manager because he was more mature than us. Uh, but he, uh, he got really good at making a, like PCB footprints and designing boards for, for complex electronics. And uh, this company, this small company called AlphaCore uh, popped up in Tempe. And it's just this, you know, it's this collection of engineers and stuff. And they get these contracts from the government called SBIRs, which are essentially like they're like hit contracts from the government for science. The government says, we need someone to design this. Give us a proposal on how you're going to do it. We'll give you the money to do it. And you can keep the patent at the end. And it's a way for the government to work with small businesses so that they get their technology that they need and small businesses get a start off the ground. So this company, AlphaCore, comes in and says that they're working on these boards and they need some help. So, you know, Eric is good at this and he starts working for them part time. And, uh, you know, they start coming around the lab more and more, and I start making jokes. You know, we, we're just goofing around, and I started calling them albacore, like the tuna and stuff like that, you know. But we had a good relationship with them. Um, but one day, we were talking at lunch, and I was like, you know, why do we even need AlphaCore? Why do we need the third-party companies? Like, we should make our own company and sign up for our own SBIR so we get all the money, you know. No hate to AlphaCore, but, you, you know, we got the people right here. And I was like, we don't need AlphaCore. I'll make a company called Beta Shell. Um, based on alpha core <laughs> and uh, it started as a joke but I was in a conference in, uh, in Boston at the uh, Center for Astrophysics at Harvard with Adrian and Ryan and one day I just wasn't that interested in the lectures that were going on so I opened up my computer and I was like how much does it cost to start a company in Arizona 
it was like 40 bucks for an LLC. So we just made one beta shell. We put our names on the list. I got a note in the mail, signed up for my certificate of good standing. And now we are officially owners of a company with some employees. I, uh, my, if you look at my LinkedIn, um, I replaced my first title, which was PhD candidate. And it now starts off with CEO of beta shell LLC. (laughs) And I get all these ridiculous messages from people on LinkedIn being like, I'm trying to connect with other CEOs. And I just sit there laughing. It's like, we don't do anything. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it was, it was a fun, it was, you know, it's a fun project to have. And we always love like bounce off ideas of things that we could do in industry. Um, I have a pipe dream of one day creating uh, satellites that will, look for water on asteroids or ice on asteroids because I believe that f- water will be the future of fuel for, for space mining, right? Where it's very expensive to launch with fuel. So they're going to want launch with as little fuel as possible and find fuel in space and ice can be turned into fuel quite easily. So I was like, well, you know, someone's going to need to prospect that stuff. We can use simple cube sets to do that. You know, pop up a cube set around a bunch of asteroids, look to see if they have ice water. We find a fueling spot. We sell the information for a bajillion dollars, and bingo. So that's our that's our that's our future future goal. You know, one of these days I'll e- email my good buddy Elon Musk um, and tell him I got an idea. But we've we've done other things too. The IR thermometers uh, were were somewhat of a beta shell idea. Um, you know, we've had one meeting. Uh, I bought everyone their shawarma, um, and that's the only expenditure of the company so far. Um, but yeah, it's going to be huge. I tell everyone it's a, it's a technology disruptor. Um, it's revolutionizing the field. Uh, you know, you just lie. At, that's what all these LLCs do. So one of these days, yeah, you might see it plastered on Lincoln Field or something like that. Go to an Eagles game and see a big beta shell logo up there. Um, yeah, we're going places. So yeah, if you need a job, uh, email me at betashell25 at gmail.com. You know, it's a real email. We don't have a website yet. We'll make one. I promise. Um, yeah. So that's that's our that's our future goal. Perfect. Are they paid Everyone, in monop- monopoly money? Is that how that? Uh, works? Essentially, yeah. Uh, shawarma, <laughs> shawarma. Uh, right, right, shawarma. A lot more valuable than monopoly money. That's true. <laughs> shawarma is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, that's my plug. Perfect. Today's sponsor is. Swarm yeah, Air- yeah, today's sponsor. <laughs> yeah, Beta Shell LLC. And Beta Shell LLC. Yeah, it's a, there, there are a lot of other cool projects that we're doing in the lab um, starting now, you know, that, you know, maybe one of these days we'll have another podcast to talk about. Um, we've started this new really very bizarre project with a, a, a well, you know, renowned professor at UCLA, this woman named Mona Jarahi. And uh, we started this project for this crazy uh, laser mixer that uh, is, is able to mix terahertz frequencies together at room temperature. And usually it has to be done at cryogenics and it would revolutionize the field. And uh, we just got funding from the Moore Foundation who funds crazy projects. So we're just starting that, which is uh, it's gonna be really neat. We have all these balloon missions going on. Um, so yeah, there's a ton of stuff uh, going for the future for us that we're really excited about. Sounds like good content for a future podcast episode. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We want to shout out everyone in the lab. You know, miss you guys. Yeah. I think we've mentioned almost everyone at some point. Yeah. John's the only one who hasn't seen pretty much everyone. Yeah. I got COVID. So <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've been locked down recently. Yeah. I'll go. I go. To, sometime, I'll go down to the basement sometimes, mostly for coffee. But it's also like it's nostalgic because I don't work there anymore, and it's yeah. it's very weird to like yeah, well, you know you spend all of your time in this one place for so long, um, and then it's just like suddenly one day you know you don't have to be there anymore. Uh, is your face on the wall? No, her face isn't on the wall. Your face is not well, on the but wall. I didn't, work, I didn't work for you guys though. We have like custodians' <laughs> faces on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, they drew themselves on there. Yeah, it's a matter of okay, asking. Well, That's all it takes. Okay, I'll have to yeah. ask. You'll have to draw yeah. me like one of your French girls at some point then. Okay. Yeah, I will. Yeah, my, okay. my art degree will come in handy. Yeah, John is taking over from Gena. Yeah. Oh, I was, I've always wondered who started that. Yeah. Yeah, it was Gena and how I do it. 
Mine aren't, mine aren't as good as Guinness. Guinness had a very special taste to them. But, you know, sort of je ne sais quoi. Je ne sais quoi, yeah. But yeah, you're always welcome, Sarah, you know? We yeah. love having people down there. And Yeah, yeah and if, uh, if anyone ever wants to see what's going on in ISD before, you can just go down to the basement. <laughs> you don't need access yeah, to just go down Yeah, seriously, like, yeah. Well, actually, uh, oh, come yeah. after COVID. Yeah. You can't come in the building unless you have access. Yeah. And, uh, uh, come after COVID. And yeah, but anyone listening to this, if you want to see some cool science, just yeah. walk on in in a few months, Heck, come down to the basement. That's how Cody got on uh, Phoenix. He was just like, he was in ice before, and he yeah. was like, what's in the basement? <laughs> and he, yeah. he made that's his happened. way down to the yeah. basement. And then, yeah. like, I think, was it Ham? It was Hamdi or Leroy let him in into our lab, and he was, and I was telling him about Phoenix, and yeah, next thing you know, we, he started programming <laughs> programming our spacecraft so yeah. yeah you never know what you'll find in the basement of buildings is, is lesson learned from that yeah time. yeah I, and if you're if you're for some reason if you're like an asu undergrad listening to this right now um and you're at all interested in anything that we've talked about seriously email me um you know, email Justin, email professor chris Grappi, phil mouskoff or just come into the building and downstairs one of these days and we always have space for more undergrads to, you know, test their mettle. You know, if you survive for a year, we'll pay you. <laughs> I promise. So, you know, come check it out. Yeah. yeah. I want to say it's not a guaranteed promise, but we will get there. Yeah. Um, oh, I, and I want to, you know, I, I just want to do this to embarrass someone. My last shout out I'm going to do is for my girlfriend, Grace Carlson, who is also a PhD student in CC, but she does geology. Uh, I just want to shout her out. She recently won the uh, really prestigious uh, finest proposal. Uh, That's awesome. So she got, yeah, she got the finest fellowship. And she's uh, been working on this uh, prison education program uh, recently where they are going to prisons and teaching them geology and astrophysics classes. That's awesome. Um, That's really awesome. Yeah. And if anyone wants to join with that too, look that up, the ASU Bridges and Education Program. Grace is always looking for, you know, more people who are willing to help out with that. But yeah, I just want to make sure people know she's doing some awesome stuff. Cool. Well, on that note, I guess we'll, we'll end it here. Uh, is it, thank you guys so much again. Yeah. This, was, this was so much fun. Um, it was really, really fun to, to talk to you guys. And yeah. um, now I kind of feel like I chose the wrong major, <laughs> I think, after, after hearing all this. <laughs> Yeah. You can always switch. I mean, like, yeah, you can yeah. always just come join us. Anytime. Yeah, you can, or just work on a side project downstairs with us, you know? Yeah, just get, get Chris as your uh, yeah. project manager. It's very tempting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you for having us on. And sorry for taking up <laughs> geez, yeah, a lot of your three time. hours. Oh, jeez. Yeah. It's okay. You know, I, I split uh, episodes fun. into two parters. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, well, this is an awesome idea. This is a cool podcast. Yeah, this is a great idea. This is cool. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm 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 proud of my little baby project. So. Well, my friends, that concludes part two of this epic two-part series. Thanks again to Justin and John for passing along all of their insight and stories, and thank you all so much for supporting this podcast. I had so much fun recording this episode and learning a lot more about what these guys have been up to lately. And I, I know this was said a bunch of times throughout the interview, but the Terahertz Lab is you know, really just a great group of people. The whole environment that was created down there in the basement when we were working on Phoenix for just hours and hours and hours was just what made our time in the lab just so much more memorable and enjoyable. And I, I just, I have a lot of respect for these guys. So if any of you guys are listening, hello, <laughs> for one, and you know, just thank you for being awesome and inspiring. As one final thought on this episode, I will say that John's metaphor of thinking of fast forward transforms as blending a smoothie makes me want to write a book that just explains a bunch of complex science topics in the form of food metaphors, because I just feel that this is a resource that we are all missing from our lives. I don't know, you know, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm not alone. Shoot me an email if you want to help me make this a thing. But. That is all for today's episode, my friends. Don't forget to follow this podcast to get updates for more fun conversations. Give this a like on Facebook and share these episodes with your friends who might enjoy them. Here's looking forward to future adventures and the lessons learned from them. Cheers. Sarah. <laughs>